Well, hello. hello. Once again, it's uh, time for our Wednesday night Bible study again. And uh, looking forward to, uh, to being with you as we uh, continue this process. You want to say anything to your ladies? I miss you. I, it's really gotten bad now. I've been trying to think today uh, already. I was thinking about what can I do to like get them all to correspond with me. We have some kind of Bible scavenger hunt or something. So if you have any ideas, let me know or just send me an update on how you're doing. That'd be good. Okay. Uh, we are, as you know, I sent the email out tonight or for tonight that we're having a deacon's meeting. Our goal uh, is to be, Lord willing, have some kind of service, service or services on May 31st. So we'll hopefully give you kind of a plan for that layout in the next couple of days after the deacons uh, work through some things. So looking forward uh, to being back uh, together again, uh, hopefully on May 31st. Uh, we also mentioned to you, uh, we leave on some vacation. Uh, just headed to Florida, looking forward to some time to relax. And so we're doing an awful lot of recording over the next few days. We'll record this message, then uh, Tim and Kristen uh, Stalkup are going to record a report this afternoon and also the next Wednesday night's message. Tomorrow I'll record Sunday the 17th's message. Friday I'll record uh, Sunday the 24th's message. And then Brother Adam's going to do a double children's message recording tomorrow night. So, lots of recording going on. So, if you're one of these types that go to YouTube early and view it, then you'll have everything already. So, uh, I'm in short sleeves today, so I don't know if you can see my wound is healing pretty good, but it's still quite the deal there. Uh, showed you last week as part of the illustration. So, anyway, thank you for praying for us, praying for you guys, Mike and Mary. Uh, praying for you as well. Uh, just some exciting good news. Um, uh, David and Vanessa Bray, they visited with us a couple of months ago. Well, we've been out a couple of months, so probably three or so months ago. A young couple uh, with three little girls and uh, been praying about moving this area. They moved in Tuesday night and are really excited about getting here at church and serving alongside of us. And uh, so once all this comes, we'll have a new family to add to us as well, which is pretty exciting. Um, also pray for uh, Jason Windangle and Carrie. Um, Jason's grandfather died yesterday and uh, was an incredible godly man. Pastored the church that Jason's daddy pastors uh, was, led his cardiologist to the Lord uh, just a week ago. So just a really godly, wonderful testimony, but it's tough. And he's been married uh, to his wife. Uh, we're, Jason and I are guessing, well over 60 years. Uh, he was close to 90. And uh, so pray for them. Pray for the family. Jason's brother was supposed to get married this weekend. And I just don't sure all of what's going on. So I know, they, I know Jason and them will appreciate your prayers. And then, of course, Mike and Mary uh, continue to pray for him as uh, Mike's um, had a little bit of difficulty the last few days. Mike, if you're watching, we're praying for your brother. We love you. Mary, too. And then, of course, uh, the kids were able to come down. Holly and Andrew are here, and uh, Tammy and Sean are here as well. We're praying for your family, so I trust you uh, be able to get some quality time uh, together. Okay, our character quality today is Jehovah Shalom, uh, one that you know as well. The God of peace. We are meant to know the fullness of God's perfect peace, his shalom. God's peace surpasses understanding and sustains us through difficult times. It is the product of fully being what we were created to be. Judges chapter 6 and verse 16, the story of Gideon. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee and bring forth my present and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry till thou come again. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes of ephod of flour and the flesh he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot and brought it out unto him under the oak and presented it. 
And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and unleavened cakes, and lay them upon this rock, and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand, and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up fire out of the rock, and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Until this day, it is yet an Orphra of the Abin Zerites. Oh, Jehovah Shalom. Dear difficult times, it's nice to have peace, isn't it? Our God is a wonderful God of peace. We're grateful for his characteristic. Psalms 119. Psalms 119, if you would. Last week, we talked a little bit about the appointment with love and the soldier and the lady in the yellow dress and, and how this uh, little old lady said, I don't know what this is all about, but that young lady said, if you pass the test, so to speak. And the theme of our message was actions speak louder than words. And we started last week at Psalms 119, verse 105. And we're going to carry through, through through 136. And last week, we talked about the path of God's word. It brought light to us. Our principle, one of our principles was God's word is good for my steps and my direction. The second principle we learned last week was when I respond to God's word properly, then I become a light for others. A third principle from last week was, as I obey God's word, his favor is towards me, and I then can learn more of his word. It becomes a wonderful cycle. We're going to talk a little bit more about obedience even today. So our second truth, the first was the path of God's word. Let's look at number two, the performance of God's word. The performance of God's word. The Bible says in Psalms 119, verse 106, I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Now, the, the author is making a commitment to God. Look at verse 112. I've inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. So the psalmist is saying, God, I am going to keep your word. Whatever your word tells me, that's what I'm going to do. The word perform means to fulfill or to confirm or to ratify or to establish. In other words, he says, I'm going to do exactly what you said, or I'm going to establish your word to other people. He has promised God, and he plans to fulfill that promise. So here's our principle from this text of Scripture. What we tell God we will do, we must do. What we tell God we will do, we must do. Now, now all of us, if we're not careful, will be guilty of that which people call foxhole decisions. Now, you may have never been in the military, uh, but that's a common thing. And that is when we get into difficulty, uh, maybe we're, we're begging God for an answer to prayer. God, if you'll just do, then I'll do. Well, those are commitments that God expects us to keep. And there's been times in my life when I've made commitments and then couldn't remember all that I said to God. And it's like, okay, Lord, what, what, what did I actually say? And so one of the things that I've done on some of those commitments like that is begin to write them down. God, this is what I told you that we would do so that I won't be able to forget those things. Saul, remember Saul, King Saul in the Old Testament? He said, I have performed what God said, but he hadn't really had it. You remember the story of Saul going and killing the Amalekites, so to speak. But First Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22, and Saul said, I'm sorry, and Samuel said, hath the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. King Saul said, but, but I have obeyed what you told me to do. And Samuel's like, well, what's this bleeding of the ears? What, what's these sheep I hear? Well, the people took and da-da-da-da. Oh, and by the way, here's the king of them. But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. You don't understand what obey is, do you? Simple songs that we know and sometimes sing without thinking. Now, hopefully, one of the benefits of us being a part is 
we're going to sing songs, I think, with a different, different attitude, if we will. But trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Do you, do you trust God? And if so, then do you obey him? Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. Um, we, we know that song, O-B-E-D-I-E-N-C-E, right? But, but do we actually obey? There's some Bible examples of obedience and, and the results. You, you could maybe take some time to stop this and ask your family, give some, what are some Bible examples of obedience and what were the results of that? Or maybe you could flip it around. What are some Bible examples of disobedience and the results of that. Uh, like as example, the three Hebrew children. Uh, God had told them not to bow, and so what did they do? Well, King, it doesn't matter what you tell us. We're gonna be respectful, but we're not gonna bow to this. Now, I think that's a, by the way, good principles about what we're dealing with now, right? We're gonna try to be respectful to those in authority over us, but we're not gonna violate God's word. What did they do? They went into the fire. God didn't keep them out of the fire, but he met them in the fire. See, we don't always see all that's going on around us. Hebrews 11 tells us that many of these people died in faith, having seen the promises, but not actually been able to obtain them. Abraham never got to see the children of Israel fully in the land of promise. So there's other times when we can look in the word of God where people obeyed and what were the results. Now be careful. Not always does obedience equal good results. The truth is sometimes we obey and from our perspective, bad things happen, but God is still be pleased with our obedience. Jesus was obedient to go to the cross, was he not? We wouldn't call that a good result from a human standpoint. But boy, we understand how he redeemed us on Calvary. It's a wonderful result. When do I obey then? Well, the psalmist gives us some of these things. Number one, we obey in difficult times. Psalms 1, 1 verse 107, I'm sorry, in this. I'm a... When, I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy word. Uh, in difficult times, look at verse 134. 134. Deliver me from the oppression of men, so will I keep thy precepts. The psalmist says, I've got men around me. They're, they're oppressing me. Uh, the, the psalmist says that he's afflicted very much, but what's he going to do? In difficult times, I'm going to obey. In dangerous times, he says he'll obey. Look at verse 109. My soul is continually in my hand. We're gonna come back to that phrase in just a little bit. It's a, it's a powerful thought. Yet do I not forget thy law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, a trap for me. Yet I erred not from thy precepts. I'm just gonna obey. In difficult times, in dangerous times, in number three, dutiful times. Dutiful times, verse 11, 111. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. You know, sometimes when we have a heritage passed down to us, we don't value it as much as those who have fought to establish it. Be careful. Sometimes it's hard to be obedient just in times of duty. They're not glorious times. They're just day by day, moment by moment times. I'm reading a book that's not necessarily spiritual in and of itself. It's more written to secular business leaders. But one of the things he talks about is character and decisions are not made in big moments. They're made in the mundane moments of every day. Matter of fact, he often has people say, I'd love to just come spend the day with you. And he said, if you came spend the day with me, most of the time you'd be pretty bored because I do the same thing every day consistently. In dutiful times, I'm going to be obedient to God. I love what one author said. Heart obedience will survive difficulties and oppression. Head obedience will not. Devotion to the Lord inspires obedience. May we obey in those difficult times. Performance of God's word. What we tell God we will do, we must do. Are you obedient to God? Do you keep your word to him? Number three, truth. The protection of God in his word. The protection of God in his word. Notice what 107 says. I'm afflicted very much. 
Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy word. 109, my soul is continually in my hand. We're gonna talk about that, like I said. Yet do not I forget thy law. Verse 110, the wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I err not from thy precepts. Verse 114, thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Verse 116 and 117, uphold me according unto thy word, that I may live and let me not be ashamed of my hope. Hold thou me up and I shall be safe and I, and I will have respect unto thy statutes continually. The protection that God offers in his word the psalmist says, Lord, this is happening to me and this is happening to me, but I'm gonna to cling to your word. And Lord, they're setting a snare, but I'm gonna to cling to your word. Lord, it's in my hand, but I'm gonna to cling to your word. This, this statement, in my hand, it's, it's not used very much in scripture. Uh, it's used just a couple of times in this passage and in others. And it really gives us some idea of what he means when he says this protection. We'll look at a number of things. He talks about danger. He talks about deliverance. And sometimes he talks about deviance in this idea of in my hand. Notice what Judges chapter 12 and verse three says. And when I saw that she delivered me not, I put my life in my hands, passed over against the children of Ammon and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are you come up unto me this day to fight against me? Now this is one of the stories of the, of, in the Judges and it involves danger. He says, when I realized that you weren't gonna help me, I put my life in my own hand and went out to battle and won a victory. So this idea of in my hand as the idea of danger. First Samuel chapter 19 and verse five, for he did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistine. It's referring to David here. So number two, it's talking about deliverance, danger, deliverance. Uh, David put his life in his hand, trusting God. But sometimes there's also this third idea of this, this in thy hand, and that's deviance. Notice in 1 Samuel 28, verse 21, okay? Now, it says here, and the woman came unto Saul. Who is this woman? It's the witch. It's the one that Saul went to and asked, could she bring up Samuel? So notice the verse. It says, and the woman came unto Saul and saw that he was sore troubled and said unto him, behold, thine handmaid hath obeyed thy voice and I have put my life in my hand and have hearkened unto thy words, which thou speakest unto me. What's she talking about? Well, it was illegal to be a witch, not only biblically, but Saul had tried to purge them out. And now she's actually before King Saul and she says, King Saul, I put my life in the hand. Sometimes that deviant idea of it as well. So that's part of this protection that God talks about. The psalmist says, my soul is continually in my hand. But then he talks about that God is our shield and our hiding place. This speaks of defense. Genesis chapter 15 and verse one. After these things, the word of the Lord came into Abram in a vision saying, fear not Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, I want you to just imagine, get a word picture, if you will, with me for a minute. What would it be like for God to be your shield? What could come through that shield? <laughs> I've worn a Kevlar uh, vest. Now, it's a heavy jacket without sleeves. It's kind of one of those things. And the truth is, we didn't want to wear them, particularly in hot places. We wanted to, uh, to undo them. But if you got hit with a grenade or some other things like that, it, it would save your life potentially. But can I tell you, it wasn't, there was, there was bullets and things that could go through that. It wasn't impenetrable. But God as the shield, he tells Abraham, don't worry, I got this. I'm your shield. Wow, the defense. Psalms 3 and verse 3, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me and thy glory in the lifter up of mine hand. Can I tell you this? As you go back to this trust aspect, nothing happens in the will of God outside of God's permission. That's a wonderful truth. Satan could not get to Job until he got God's permission to get to Job. Therefore, we can trust that God knows best in everything. Psalms 28 verse seven, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusteth in him and I am helped. God, you're gonna be that shield. And then the psalmist talks about, in this passage, these verses that we read, the idea of hold me up. 
And this means to sustain or to support or to strengthen. And this speaks of durability that he says here. And all this comes from what? From, from being in God's word. So, so here's the principle that I want us to see from this text of scripture. True protection only comes from God. And in that protection, we should trust. True protection only comes from God. And it is in that protection that we should trust. You're like, well, Pastor, what if God chooses to not protect me in the car accident? True protection comes from God and we trust in that. So if God didn't protect us in this accident, then, then he knew this was best for us in all kinds of ways. And we're saying, but wait a minute, I don't think that's best right now. I, I know that's what we think, but that's why we trust him. That's why we, as the song says, bow the knee. When we can't see all that's going on, when the scenes around us are shifting, we trust the hand of God. We trust him. True protection only comes from God and in that protection, we should trust. Protection is only as good as the actual protection. <laughs> I know that sounds duh, uh, but my brother and I built a fort. Well, I built a fort and he built a fort and mine was out of pretty cheap, thin wood and uh, I had built it in a place and we were gonna, we were gonna have a war. Uh, that's what boys do if you don't happen to have boys. Um, we, we, we do dangerous things as kids. Girls play with baby dolls generally. But anyway, um, that's why it's unique to have boys as you moms out there can figure out. Um, but so once I built my fort, then we were going to take these hard clay balls. They were dirt, but they were pretty hard and chunk them at each other and see, you know, if we could battle each other and who was going to get hit and whose fort was going to be protect them. Do you know what I found out when my brother started heaving rocks? Well, that's what it felt like to me. They were actually dirt clods, but they were pretty heavy, was my fort had no protection whatsoever. I mean, the roof started being pelted to pieces. They, those things came through that roof as if there was no protection at all. And then you know what I did? I got mad at my brother. Boy, I went charging up that hill. I was going to take him out, you know? And I was mad at him, but why was I mad at him? We were just playing the game, and my protection failed me. That's not his fault. <laughs> his protection did pretty well for him. Whose protection are you trusting in today? Yours? Flimsy as it may be? <laughs> are you going to trust in God's? Do I completely trust in God's protection? What does that look like in my life? Am I okay with saying, God, you're in control and I'm okay with that? The fifth truth from this text of scripture. We see purposeless thoughts without God's word. Notice what he says in Psalms 113, or verse 113. I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. This word thoughts is the only time it's used. It means ambivalent or divided or half-hearted thoughts. Well, what's the psalmist saying? I don't want these, these half-hearted thoughts, these divided heart thoughts. I want to concentrate on your word. Your law I love, but God, sometimes this old flesh just fights me. Romans chapter 12 and verse 9 says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. So here's our principle we want to see here. My thoughts should be rooted in God's word. Now, have you ever found yourself drifting off in thoughts? Are they rooted in God's word or do you find yourself wondering about all kinds of stuff out here? Have you ever heard the phrase, a penny for your thoughts? We don't quite understand that the way they used to. Now, the saying is from a time in, the Brit in Britain when the penny was worth a significant sum. Matter of fact, in 1522, Sir Thomas More uh, wrote in the Four Last Things, his book there, it often happeneth that the very face showeth the mind walking a pilgrimage. In other words, your mind's wandering away. In such wise than other folk say to them, a penny for your thought? Where's your mind at right now? So, so here's the point. Are you thinking thoughts that please God? Not just empty, vain thoughts, divided thoughts. How does the preaching of God's word and my daily reading of God's word impact my thinking? Does it impact your thinking? How am I thinking today? The fifth truth that we'll see here is the purifying fires of God. 
Notice what he says in verse 118 and 120. Thou hast trodden down all them that err from thy statutes, for their deceit is falsehood. Thou puttest away all the wicked of the earth like dross. Therefore I love thy testimonies. My flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgments. One author said he is a God of infinite love, but he is also a God of awesome and terrifying holiness. Habakkuk 3 and verse 16 says, When I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. The fact is, there are some times when the fear of God will make us tremble. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. So here's the principle we want to see here. Refining fires reveal what was really there all along. Refining fires reveal what was there all along. In other words, may I allow God to remove the dross so that he may be seen, so that I may be used. Those who are wicked, God will completely remove. Now, it would take hours and perhaps a chemical engineer for sure to explain everything about this subject. But I do know this much. Different metals purify at different temperatures and different temperatures produce different qualities of metals. Okay, you can do a simple search and figure that out. Here's the point. God knows what each of us can take and he knows what he's making of us. Maybe you're thinking, well, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't need the heat that hot because uh, not only that, but, but Sally over here, her heat wasn't that hot, but God's making something different of you than he's making of Sally. I think I've told the story before of the first time I had a heart exam, a, a stress test. And uh, I'd heard that it was horrible, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And they put medicine in you. And, and uh, I hear the guy next door taking the test. And after about, I don't know, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, something like that, they were like, okay, sir, you're done. And I'm thinking, okay. I, at the time, I think I was 30 years old or something like that. And I'm like, I can get on a treadmill for 60 seconds. Come on. I mean, it can't be that bad. So I get on the treadmill, they inject this stuff into my arm and, and I'm running along and running, running, running. I'm like, I got this, I got this. And after a little while, I'm thinking, they're not turning this thing off. And I'm huffing and puffing and running and huffing and puffing. And finally I said, ma'am, that other guy's test was like 30 or 60 seconds. I'm, I'm a lot longer than that. And she laughed at me and she said, sir, he was 90 plus years old. It didn't take him very long for his heart rate to get up. I was like, oh, okay. God knows what we need. God knows what purifying we need. God knows exactly what he's doing with us. How do we view refining fires? The sixth truth from this text of scripture, the panting after God's word. The panting after God's word. Verse 127, Therefore, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. I hate every false way. Thy testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, doth my soul keep them. Verse 131, I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for thy commandments. The word pant means to be eager for to pant after, to grasp after. Psalms 42 and verse one, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Probably the famous verse that most of us would know. Can I ask you, do you pant after God? Do you long for him? Do you, are you eager for God's word? Do you wake up in the morning with, ah, oh, I gotta do this again, or oh, I get to do this again. What a difference. We should be desperate. Here's the principle for this section. We should be desperate to be in God's word. 
We should be desperate to be in God's Word. Can I ask you, have you spent time in God's Word? Over the last two months, have you spent time in God's Word? I know schedules are off and all that kind of stuff, but but have you have you listened to these messages? I know that I don't know that you're listening to them, but God does. I don't know if you're listening to the whole message, but God does. I don't know if you're skipping messages, but God does. You need God's word. Do you pant after it? I remember, uh, again, just briefly, a time when we landed in Green Beach in the Philippines. It was one of, until I've been to some places, at that time, it was one of the hottest places I'd ever been. It was so hot that we could not keep the water in our canteens cool. They would they would fly in, helicopter in, fresh water, and we would dig holes in the dust and, and, and pour water in the hole and put our canteens in there and then lay equipment over top of it. And in just a little while, it was so hot you could hardly drink it. But if you didn't drink it, you were going to die. It was so, so hot. And we panted after water. We desperately wanted. How desperate are you for God's word? Number seven, and lastly, the pain of rejection of God's word. The psalmist says in verse 136, rivers of waters run down mine eyes because they kept not thy word. In other words, the psalmist is heartbroken because people will not keep God's word. You know the song, weep or the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save, Jesus stood over Jerusalem in Matthew 23 and verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings. And you would not. Jesus viewing the city, brokenhearted over their rejection of him. The principle from this text is this. People rejecting God and his word should cause a sorrow rather than a smug indignation. Now, sometimes I think Christians almost delight in pointing out people's sin. Now, now listen, there are times when we need to point out sin. I'm not saying that. But it ought to break our heart when people sin. It ought not to be something that makes us seem better. That's what the Pharisees did. May it break our heart when we see sin like that. W.A. Criswell was a pastor of First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas for years and years and years. A godly and brilliant man. It's told that often he wept when he preached. May we have this kind of compassion. I tried to verify this story, but I've heard the story that one time in a staff meeting, he was his, his had multiple level building and his offices apparently were a little bit higher. And he was looking out the windows with tears streaming down his eyes, weeping over the city of Dallas and Fort Worth while they're talking about other stuff. And finally, someone stopped and asked him, Dr. Criswell, what are you doing? And they turn and see weeping in his eyes. May we be passionate about God's word and may we have pain when it's rejected. How do we respond? How do we respond to rejection of God's word? How do we respond in our life when we reject God's word? We've said it before, but want to emphasize again, your walk talks and your talk talks but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Actions speak louder than words. I won't review all these principles, but there's been some rich ones here for us. And I know this has been a little long today, but may God have, may God give us a passion for his word and may we be in it as never before. Let's pray together. Father, oh, how we love you and how we're grateful that we even have a copy of your word and that we can study it. Thank you, sweet Jesus, for that. May we passionately pursue you through your word. In your name we pray, amen. God bless, we'll see you next time.